what Pentecostals do not understand about the five symbolic meanings of the day of Pentecost. This is part four in the False Signs and Wonders series. We've been working through this series about false signs and wonders. They are an important feature of the end time Great Tribulation. Although we're not in that time period yet, we are in the apostasy, and we even see signs and wonders today amongst the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements. The true signs and wonders were definitely happening in the apostolic church that was in the first century AD, but they were limited to that time. They validated the apostles who God used to write the New Testament. They were also symbols of spiritual truth and brought the gospel. Signs and wonders are very enticing, but not true. The Pentecostals use that and they name themselves after the day of Pentecost. So we want to understand in this video exactly what the day of Pentecost symbolically meant. And we're going to do that. Please consider subscribing to this channel. There's a little red button in the bottom right hand corner. And let's move on in this study. Concerning the day of Pentecost, the Pentecostals and Charismatics believe that it's really a celebration of the giving of the Holy Spirit, not for salvation, because they believe those people were already saved. They believe it's the giving of the Holy Spirit for powerful signs and wonders. It's the baptism into the Holy Spirit that, that's evidenced by speaking in tongues. And that's not what the baptism of the Holy Spirit means. And we're going to look at that in the next video. And ultimately, the Pentecostals believe there's really two levels of being a Christian. There's Christians that are not baptized in the Spirit, and they have the Holy Spirit indwelling them only, but they don't become the full gospel or the full experience of being a Christian until they have this baptism in the Holy Spirit where they're speaking in tongues with all type of signs and wonders. So that's the problem with Pentecost, and we're going to see that that's completely untrue, and let's dig into that right now. Okay, these are the five symbolic truths about the day of Pentecost, and we're going to go through these. It's a feast. It's a feast from the Old Testament. It was a holy convocation. Convocation means a calling. It's a holy calling of all of God's people. There's not two separate classes of Christians. It's not only meant for those who are Pentecostal. It's the harvest of the first fruits, which points to the salvation of all God's people. It's a food offering, which points to the service of all God's people. It occurs the 50th day after seven Sabbath, which points to the fact that it's the day of salvation. That's what it's a symbol of. It's also a symbol of the unity of all of God's people that are one in Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at that in this video. We do have upcoming videos in the series about the baptism in the Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, tongues, and many other videos that are coming in the Spirit. So you may want to subscribe to keep up with them. But for now, let's move into our study. Okay, the day of Pentecost, these are the passages that discuss the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we're going to go through some of these and we're going to reference some of these in this lesson. But if you want to study this in more depth outside this video, please look at these passages. All of them together are the basis of the Feast of Weeks or the day of Pentecost. Okay, First, we're going to look at the fact that Pentecost is a holy convocation, which means it's a holy calling of God's people. Okay, first we want to understand that in the Old Testament, there were feasts of the Lord. There are seven. It's, they're covered very neatly in Leviticus 23. The seventh day Sabbath, the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of first fruits, the Feast of Weeks, which are also first fruits, also known as the Day of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is another harvest type of feast. So these are the seven feasts. We're going to be focused in on the Feast of Weeks, also known as the Feast of First Fruits or the Day of Pentecost. First, we want to understand what is a holy convocation in the Old Testament. We see right in Leviticus 23, 
concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. And we see later in the same chapter, you shall proclaim on the self same day, which is the day of Pentecost, that it may be a holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. So we see that the day of Pentecost is a holy convocation. Again, in Numbers 28, also in the day of first fruits, after your weeks be out, and that's referring to the day of Pentecost, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. So there's many references to the fact that the day of Pentecost is a holy convocation. The word holy in the Bible means to be set apart for purity. It's, it's God's, all God's people are made holy. God has made them holy. The convocation is the Hebrew word mikra, which literally means something that is called out. It's a calling out of God's people. It's a day that they do no serve our work, which points to the rest, the, 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 the day, a Sabbath day of salvation. So for now, we just need to understand that a holy convocation is a holy calling. So when we look at that in the New Testament, we see that all Christians have a holy calling. We see in 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. That's that same word, the same phrase, the same idea that's in the Old Testament. It's a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to God's own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We are saved by grace completely. He calls us due to his sovereign good pleasure and his sovereign will. We don't make a decision for Christ. It's a holy calling. Romans 8, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. God does all the work of salvation, including calling his people into this holy convocation of being a Christian. Pentecostals wrongly teach, they wrongly teach that the day of Pentecost is, is all about the baptism in the spirit for only a subset of all Christians. It's a, they believe it's a second filling it's a special infilling. It's for people that are going to speak in tongues. Then they're going to do signs and wonders. They have two classes of Christians. And that's completely contrary to this holy convocation or holy calling of all God's people. Another thing that the Pentecostals don't emphasize or understand is that the day of Pentecost is a harvest of first fruits which means all of God's people. The harvest points to salvation. Okay, going back to our list of the Old Testament feasts, we see that of these seven feasts, three of them had to do with the harvest. The Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks, otherwise known as the First Fruits or Pentecost, Day of Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Ingathering. So please note that of these three feasts concerning the harvest, two of them have to do with the first fruits. So let's look at that a little bit more. Okay, so focusing in a little bit more on these three feasts, the feast of first fruits, it was the morning after the Sabbath. It was the first of the first fruits. And that's a symbolic representation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he's the first fruits. And we're going to look at that on an upcoming slide. The Feast of Weeks, also known as the Day of Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Harvest, it's, it's a symbol of God's people being saved in the Spirit, the salvation that we currently have. And then the third Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Ingathering, it's a symbol of the joyous eternity with God. It's the last day salvation of the soul, where we're raised into a spiritual body. And I will tag this slide with the previous study we did on the Feast of Tabernacles. But let's move on and focus in on these Feasts of First Fruits. So it's important to note that there's two feasts involving First Fruits. 
The first fe feast, which is actually called the Feast of First Fruits, points to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the very first fruits of the harvest, and that's Jesus Christ because he's the first to be resurrected. And it occurred on the morrow after the Sabbath. And then when one counts 50 days from the morrow after the Sabbath, there was another feast, which was called the Feast of Weeks. It was seven weeks later, and then the day after that, which is 50 days, which again points to the, it's the day of Pentecost. So there's actually two feasts of first fruits. The first one was Jesus Christ, and the second one, the day of Pentecost, we're going to see is the salvation of God's people. So now when we turn to the New Testament and we look at first fruits, first fruits, we see that Jesus Christ is the first fruits. Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. Every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So we see Jesus Christ referred to as the first fruits. But Christians are also first fruits. Christ is the first fruits, but Christians are called that too. Christ is intimately tied to the feast of first fruits, that second of the seven feasts. The third of the seven feasts, which is the day of Pentecost, is also a feast of the first fruits. It's 50 days later, and it's the day of Pentecost, tied right back to Acts 2. So we see in James 1.18 of his own will, God's will, not our will, God's will, he begat us to the word of, by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, just like Christ, because we're spiritually born again. We're spiritually resurrected in the spirit. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit. The day of Pentecost was the given of the Holy Spirit. It's when God's people were baptized into the spirit that all Christians are baptized into the Spirit, not just the, the Pentecostal few. All true Christians are baptized in the Spirit, and we have the first fruits of the Spirit, and that's tied directly to the day of Pentecost. And we groan in ourselves, waiting for the adoption, which is the redem redemption of the body, which happens on the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when our soul, and we're raised into our spiritual glorified body on the last day. Note the context of Romans 8. We, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. We've been baptized in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God dwelling you. If you are a true Christian, you've been baptized into the Spirit. If any man not has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If we're not baptized in the Spirit, we're not a Christian. If we don't have that assurance, that indwelling, that sealing of the Holy Spirit, that we're a new creation, a new creature, we're not truly saved. Continuing, and if Christ be in you, the spirit of Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But then the spirit convicts our spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that we're baptized in leads us into the ways of righteousness. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. It's the baptizing of the spirit, which is directly linked to Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. And we're going to look at that baptism in the spirit in the next video. Okay, so Pentecost, again, is a harvest of salvation. When we see a harvest, a harvest points to salvation. Exodus 23, 16 says, The day of Pentecost is also called a feast of harvest, the first fruits. But then we look at John chapter 4. Say ye not, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest, which would refer to the, to the late in the year harvest, which would be the feast of uh, a feast of tabernacles behold i say to you lift up your eyes and look to the fields they are white already into harvest because salvation in our bodies now the salvation that we have is our spirits are recreated we're, we were we become a new man we have a new spirit we're born again the salvation of the spirit occurs now in the body the salvation of the soul and that glorified spiritual body happens on the last day, which is sim symbolized by the Feast of Tabernacles. Math Matthew 9, he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. The harvest is now. It's the, it, the day of Pentecost started that. And it's, it symbolizes the harvest of the first fruits of God's people, Christians.
Now we're going to turn to look at the offering that was made on the day of Pentecost. The key offering was to make a new food offering. And we're going to see in the next few slides that that points to and it's symbolic of the service of God's people. Going back to those key passages on the day of Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Weeks or, or First Fruits, we see that you shall offer a new meat offering. And when you see the word meat in the Old Testament in the King James, it literally means a bloodless food offering. Meat is used as a general term for food. You're offering, it could be grain, it could be any type of vegetation. It's a food offering. And a second witness to this is Numbers 28. At the day of first fruits, when you bring a new meat offering, a new food offering unto the Lord, after your weeks be out, that's the four, the, the seven weeks, so on the 50th day, and then you have that holy complication. So we see that this food offering, it's a bloodless offering. It could be fine flour, barley, would be would make sense in the early harvest. Leviticus 6.20 this is the offering in Aaron and his sons, which shall offer unto the Lord in the day he is anointed. The tenth part of an ephah of, ephah of fine flour for a meat offering, which is really a food offering, perpetual, half of it in the morning, half at night. So we see that the key offering is a food offering, and we're going to go on now and see what that spiritually means. Okay, and we see at salvation, Christians are new. This is a new grain offering that we're talking about here. And we see that Christians are new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Galatians 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Colossians 3, 10, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Jesus said, verily, verily, I said to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The newness of being born again. That's why this is referred to as a new grain offering. But Christians are also referred to as offerings in the New Testament. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. We're not designed here to be to be live in pleasure and reap material possessions and reach our destiny and have promotions and all type of material possessions and money. We're an offering. Second Timothy four six. I am now ready to be offered, and the time my departure is at hand. Hebrews thirteen fifteen. Let uh, therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God, the offer of sacrifice continually. That is the fruit of our lips given thanks to his name. 1 Peter 2, 5. Ye also as living stones are built a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. We are meant to be a, a, a grain offering. We're a new grain offering where we sacrifice ourselves on the altar of service. Okay, so let's move on. There's also spiritual truth in the fact that the Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of First Fruits, that day, the day of Pentecost, is the 50th, 50th day after seven Sabbaths. That's what the Bible teaches, and there's spiritual truth in there. And we're going to see that that points to the day of salvation. So let's look at the passage, Leviticus 23. Uh, again, from the morrow after the Sabbath, and you remember, might remember that's the second feast, the Feast of First Fruits. So after that Feast of First Fruits, which is a symbol of Christ's resurrection, there's seven Sabbaths. So there, there's seven Sabbaths, which is 49 days, even unto the morrow after that seventh Sabbath, that's the 50th day. That's the day of Pentecost. And then you shall offer your new food offering or meat offering unto the Lord. Same thing in Deuteronomy 16, seven weeks shall you number. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as you be, begin to put the sickle to the corn. It's the early harvest. This is the harvest of God's people on the earth now. You shall keep the Feast of Weeks unto the Lord, and you shall remember that you are a bondman in e Egypt. And that's a huge, huge reminder that a bondman in Egypt is somebody that's waiting or searching or wants to be saved. They want to be freed from that bond. It's a symbol for salvation. We see that in Romans 6 and many places in the New Testament. That, that, that the whole exodus from Egypt bondage is a symbol for salvation. So that's why the day of Pentecost is tied to salvation, and it's the salvation of all God's people, not just for Pentecostals. 
Okay, so let's look at the seven weeks. So the, the, it's interesting in the Bible, the word seven, the word weeks, the word Sabbath is all based, they're all cognate words. They're all based on a common root, which means to swear an oath. So we have seven sevens because weeks is literally the word sevened. So we have seven sevens, which are in the English called weeks. So we have to look at the symbolic meaning of seven. And I'm going to tag this slide because we've done a whole video on the symbolic meaning of seven, which means the per perfection of purpose. Most people leave off the purpose part, but the Hebrew word that they're all based on means to swear an oath. It's the perfection of purpose. It's an oath by God. It's a guarantee of our salvation. So please consider looking at that video. So the 49 days has symbolic meaning of waiting for the promise. It's God's perfect will that we patiently wait for the promise of salvation. We wait for the early harvest, which is the Feast of Weeks, the Pentecost. And we all, and, and what that means, Jesus told the disciples to wait. And we're going to look at that in an upcoming slide until the day of Pentecost. And that was the day of salvation. They were elect before that. And now it's the day of salvation. There's an, also another parallel, which we're going to look at on the next slide. The Jubilee, the seven weeks of years, 50 years, it's the Jubilee. And it had all together to do with awaiting the redemption of slaves, which all has all together to do with salvation and awaiting the redemption of the land, which has all together to do with the new heavens and the new earth. And let's take just a moment to look at that on the next slide. The Jubilee was after 49 years. There were seven Sabbaths or seven sevens of years, 49 years, and then they proclaimed liberty, freedom, Jubilee, every man returned to his possession. And it's a picture all the hirelings, all the slaves were set free, which is a symbol of salvation. They returned to the promised land. And, and it, it was a beautiful picture of salvation. Please consider spending more time studying this passage. And that we just see that the 49 years, though, was that time of patiently waiting for that jubilee. People that were hired servants or slaves, they were waiting for that 50th year to be set free. It was a jubilous year because there was freedom and it has all together to do with salvation and it's a return to the promised land which is the place of salvation okay so let's get back to 50 50 the number five and the number 10. five in the bible is the number of salvation or judgment there's five fingers on each hand there's a right hand and there's a left hand we see, for example, the ten virgins. There was five wise and five foolish. Goliath slain by David with five smooth stones. Judgment on Goliath and salvation for Israel. Five thousand men were fed with five loaves of bread. Talking about salvation. The sheep on the right hand, which has five fingers, and the goats on the left, pointing to damnation, has five fingers. So we see the number five is the number of salvation, but it's also the number of judgment. And then when we look at the the multiples of five, five times 10 and five times 100, it's always tied to forgiveness. Luke 7, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, the other 50. Again, 550. They had nothing to pay and he frankly forgave them both. He forgave them both. Tell me which one loves him more. Simon answered said, I guess he's, it's the one he forgave the most. And he said, you have rightly judged. But they were both forgiven, the debt. They were both saved. Again, 550 500 has to do with the it's a symbol they're tied to salvation just like the day of pentecost on that 50th day is tied to salvation okay pentecost finally we're getting close here to the end pentecost is a feast of the unity of god's people and that's exactly what the Pentecostals cause division on that day. With their signs and wonders, they separate themselves. They say, we are special because we're baptized in the Spirit. You Christians are not. They cause division. And it's a day of unity. And we're going to look at that on these few slides. Of the seven feasts in the Old Testament, three of them, it was required that all the males would go to Jerusalem. And that was on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is closely tied to the Passover, which has all together to do with, with Christ and his passion and his being an offering. 
So the unleavened bread, the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labor, which is the day of Pentecost, the feast of weeks, and the feast of ingathering, which is the feast of tabernacles. So those three, there was unity because all the males came to Jerusalem to hold those feasts together. And the males were representative of their families, of course. Another witness, Second Chronicles 8.13, it lists those three same feasts. And it, there it calls the day of Pentecost the Feast of Weeks instead of the Feast of Harvest or the First Fruits. They're all the same thing. But we see that this gathering in Jerusalem points to the unity of God's people. They all came together in unity to celebrate the important meaning of these feasts. But Pentecostals do the exact opposite. They use the day of Pentecost as a division in the church because they say there's only special Christians that are baptized in the Spirit. And you can tell them because they speak in other tongues and they have signs and wonders and they have wild services and they're excited and, and vibrant. And that's a point of division. And the Pentecostals cause division in the day of Pentecost instead of unity. We also see that the disciples were on one accord on Pentecost. Jesus said in Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, which is the Holy Spirit, which they were going to be baptized into the Spirit. It's going to be the day of salvation. But wait or tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from high. Jerusalem is a symbol for the, the earthly church. And they were to all tarry and wait together. And we see in Acts 1, they all went up into an upper room. These all continued with one accord. One accord. They were in unity. They were all of like mind. They were in prayer and supplication. And the number of them was 120. 120, which is symbolic. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Pentecost is a day of unity. It's the unity of God's people. And again, the Pentecostals cause it to be a day of division. 120 also highlights the unity of God's people because 120 symbolically points to the complete fullness of God's people. There was 120 disciples on that day back in the first century, but it also is a symbol for all of God's people as we're saved in the spirit. The number 10 is complete fullness. Ten virgins, ten horns, many places in the Bible, ten represents the number of complete fullness. Please look at our website. We have information on the symbolic numbers on our website. But twelve is also a symbol, a symbolic number for the government of God's church as a pillar for sending forth truth. And that's exactly where truth started, was on that day of Pentecost. Please see a tagged video I'll put on this concerning the number twelve. And again, the number 120 points to the unity of God's people, and instead the Pentecostals make it a day of division. Okay, finally, uh, unity. They're all, Jesus said that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, I in you, and they also may be one in us. God's people are to be unified, and unfortunately today, that's, that's completely not the case, but all God's true Christians have unity. They have the same true saving faith of Christ. John 14, at that day you shall know that I am in my Father, you in me, and I in you. Unity. Philippians 1 27, let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. We go out in unity, sharing the truth that they're the gospel of grace, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And as we get closer and closer to the Great Tribulation, there's more disunity, there's more division, and, it, and a lot of it is with the Pentecostal movement. Okay, just a quick summary of the Feast of Pentecost. It's a feast of a holy convocation, holy calling of all God's people. It's a harvest of the first fruits, which points to the salvation of all God's people. A food offering, it's the service of all God's people. It's the 50th day after seven Sabbaths, which points to the day of salvation for all of God's people. Unity of God's people, one in Jesus Christ. Pentecostals focus on the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is an evidence with speaking with other tongues and signs and wonders. And they use that. It's a division in the church. And they miss the true meaning of the Feast of, of Pentecost. 
And that's what we're going to look at in the next video is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see what that really means and how the Pentecostals have perverted the meaning of that. Please consider subscribing to this channel and thank you very much for watching this video.